This video is brought to you by Hunt a Killer, the murder mystery box delivered right to your door. The epic foreshadowing and stunning twists of the Netflix original series Squid Game has many fans searching deep for other hidden meanings. And we mean really deep. While some of the observant viewers have made some astute conclusions about the symbolism behind the show, others are jumping to some pretty wild conclusions. But why not? After all, what are we gonna do now that we're done with the show? Just not talk about it? That would be some bullshit. I'm Kyle with Wicked Binge, and today we'll be ranking Squid Game theories from BS to truth bombs. First up, let's get the theories out of the way that have been debunked. These theories either have so many holes that they can't possibly be true, they lack evidence, or they've been confirmed false by creators. Simply put, these theories are bullshit. The dodgy card colors determine if a recruit is a player or staff. We just want to get this one out of the way because it's one of our favorites and it kind of hurts that it has to go in this category. TikToker at Lucy.what1 posted a now viral theory that Jihan is only a player because he chose the blue dachi card when playing with the recruiter in the station. The theory suggests that if he had chosen the red card, he would have ended up as a staff member. Observant fans of the theory found further evidence during the dachi montage during the pilot all the players are shown choosing the blue card. It supported the very clever theory that what color card a person chooses determines where they end up in the games. People who chose the blue cards become players, players who chose the red cards became staff. People hopping onto the theory also notice that the colors vaguely line up with the uniforms, green for players and bright pink for staff. I like this theory a lot because it plays with predetermination. It makes a lot of sense, and it answers a burning question with fans about how the staff get chosen and recruited. Unfortunately, it was debunked by the creator. The colors of the dachi cards were actually an allusion to a Korean urban legend. In it, you'll be confronted by a ghost, asking you to choose between red paper or blue paper. Each color of paper is symbolic of a different death bleeding out, or strangulation, respectively. That said, this was still definitely a great theory. Jihun's hair represents his eventual return as staff. This is another debunked theory, but I'm not sure this one made as much sense to begin with. People are suggesting that Jihun's bold new hairstyle at the end of the season is foreshadowing. Much like the red card theory, they're saying that the red hair means Jihun is going to return in season two as one of the masked staff members. I guess it could technically be a way to bring down the organization from the inside, a stepping stone to a position with more power, but considering the state that he was in for the year following his own game, we have to wonder whether or not he'd be comfortable going back in that capacity, even as part of a ruse. The creator has debunked this one as well, though it isn't as far off as you may think. Apparently his hair color is indicative of something, his building rage at the games. Ilnam created the games to find his son. You're gonna notice a lot of theories about Ilnam on this list, and honestly, we don't blame people for having them. Player One was one of the most instantly memorable characters on this or possibly any show. When you factor in the big twist ending of his own creation, it's likely that people are going to assume he had more tricks up his sleeve. A big focus on the conspiracies that surround him is the son that he mentions, and we think that this is one of the most outlandish versions we've seen. The theory goes that Ilnam created the games in an attempt to find his son. There's nothing technically debunking this, but we'd like to give the writers a little more credit. Diluting his complex motives down to trying to find an estranged son, let's just say that if it were true, it would fall very flat. Look at all the monitoring that they have in place in order to organize the squid game and find contestants. Look at all the records they keep. While that could help find a missing son, we imagine it could find anything, it would be a very roundabout way to get there. Especially since the games are secret, it would be less effective than even taking out an advertisement. Plus, since the loneliness started after Ilnam realized he had too much money, it's not like he would have needed the money made from the games to fund a search. It's a thread that we really just don't want to pull on too much, because while it's not impossible, we might rage quit if it were true. Moving on from the BS, these theories still have a lot of problems. Not enough to say they're completely debunked, but still. 
these theories are full of holes. But before we get into our next category, I want to talk about today's sponsor, Hunt a Killer. The weather is getting colder, which means we all need more to keep us from going stir crazy inside. And if you're in need of something fun to binge while you wait for Squid Game Season 2, why not try an immersive murder mystery? Hunt a Killer is a murder mystery game delivered in a subscription box right to your door every month. Inside, you'll find a collection of clues that you'll need to decipher in order to solve a mystery. These are spread out over several episodes. This episode has you investigate an accidental death in the small town of Mallory Rock, Maine, but the sister of the deceased needs your help to prove that death was actually a murder and expose who was behind it. If you're a fan of board games, escape rooms, horror, or true crime, Hunt a Killer is the best subscription box you can ask for. Hunt a Killer now has over 100,000 active users and has a thriving, spoiler-free community that can offer assistance if the evidence has you stumped. It's a lot of fun, and you can start your investigative journey right now by going to huntakiller.com forward slash wicked binge, or by clicking the link in the description. And make sure to use code wicked binge for $10 off your purchase. A night at home doesn't have to be boring, so why not solve a murder? Thank you Hunt a Killer for sponsoring us today. Now back to the video. These theories are full of holes. Ilnam is Jihun's father. What did we tell you? We're gonna knock a lot of these Ilnam theories out of the way in this section, so just bear with us. This version of the theory suggests that player 001, or Ilnam, is in fact Jihun's father. The theory seems to trace back to Twitter user, at UnionLover. If you look past some of the obvious plot holes with the theory, the evidence behind it is actually super interesting. Ilnam mentions having a son multiple times, but then expresses that he doesn't have anywhere to be or anyone to go back to, suggesting he and the son are no longer close. He also describes the son as being just like Ji Hun. My son did too. He was just like you, friend. <laughs> the set for the game of marbles is also fashioned to look like Ilnam's old neighborhood. With the twist end, we now understand it makes sense for it to be modeled after his own neighborhood since he's in charge of the games. The interesting thing here is that Ji Hun also says that it looks like his childhood neighborhood, meaning they may have grown up in a similar location. The final leg of this theory is that when Ilnam asks if it's the 24th, and mentions his son's birthday is coming up, pointing out that Jihun's birthday is on the 26th. This is actually a discrepancy in the show, however. When Jihun enters his birthday into the ATM, he enters it as 826. But in Jihun's file, we clearly see that his birthday is on Halloween, something that is confirmed in the final episode when he states it for the phone call. What I want to see are some theories about why his birthday seems to change. Things that do make this theory slightly more tempting is that it would tie up some loose ends. In particular, it explains why Ilnam doesn't want to host the VIPs. The excuse that he gives is that he would have more fun participating than hosting, but he's already been eliminated at that point in the game, so he absolutely could have gone, unless perhaps it was too hard for him to watch his son potentially die. Like we said, the evidence is compelling, but it's also flawed. After all, he had the file on Jihun to get him into the games. It seems like there were better ways to reunite them than in a game where they could both potentially die. The salesman is Ilnam's son. The third and final version of this theory suggests that the salesman is actually Ilnam's son. Some like to piggyback this onto the theory that the games were a way to reunite them. We'd like to just look at this one for its own merits because it is compelling. The salesman has the best job in any of these games. That's debatable, of course, but he gets to hand cash to people who need it. There's less danger of him getting shot, and he doesn't have anybody's blood directly on his hands. I mean, the worst thing he has to deal with is a sore hand from all that face slapping. It does seem like a position that you'd give to a loved one in the games if you were in charge of running them. It also ties up the loose end of Ilnam's son, at least partially, in a way we find easier to swallow. Ilnam gives Jihun his jacket as a sign not to kill him. Before we knew that the old man was a criminal mastermind, it was sad to see Jihun make it to the end of the games wearing his jacket. The switch is made after player 456 wraps his jacket around the old man to cover the wet spot on his pants. When player 1 gives him a jacket back, it's the unstained jacket with his own number 1. After Jihun comes out without Ilnam, but still wearing Ilnam's jacket, we had to think of that sad scene over and over. 
but in retrospect, people are wondering if this move wasn't more calculated than we originally thought. The theory says that Ilnam knew they would be splitting up one way or the other after marbles, and wanted to leave Jihan with his jacket as a sign to the guards to protect him. This is possible, technically, I guess. But the two following games were the two where the guards had the least amount of sway. There wasn't much they could have done to protect Ji-Hun during the bridge game, and most definitely not during the squid game. With that said, we're now into the middle category, where we might stumble into some truth. Maybe. These theories are possible. Ji-Hun's plane is rigged to explode. Hear us out on this one. Redditor, I actually know nothing, has actually admitted that the line that inspired this theory does not exist. It was a misremembered quote from the show, so we understand that you may feel this theory is already on shaky ground. The theory suggests that the plane we were all so frustrated to see Ji-Hun turn his back on at the end of the show was actually going to explode once he had boarded. While the line that served as inspiration for the theory might not exist, we think the possibility does. Is it likely? Probably not. Ilnam wanted Ji-Hun to have that money, and if there was anyone behind the games who felt differently, they had a whole year to deal with him while he was living practically off the grid. It also may not be the best idea for a hidden group of people behind something like this to draw attention to themselves with terrorist attacks just to get one man. But is it possible? Absolutely. They have the knowledge and the resources to easily pull off such a thing. It's obvious, since they know he's about to get on a plane, that they were expecting him to be there. Just get on that plane. It's for your own good. And since he was about to leave a country where he was easy to observe, they may have been getting jumpy. After he threatens them, they'd have even more motive to detonate if it were true, which it still could be. But what we like about this theory is how drastically it changes the tone of the final scene. It makes it more empowering and relieving, as opposed to bittersweet and filled with worry. Jun Ho isn't dead. This is a very popular one. It could easily be wishful thinking, because none of us wanted him to die, but it also has potential. Say what you want about Squid Game, but it likes showing us when characters die, in a definitive and unquestionable way. We see them shot in the head, we see their brains busted out, we see their coffins nailed shut and incinerated. Notably, one of the few deaths we don't see personally is Ilnam's. And look what happened there. The assumption with Jun Ho is that if the bullet didn't kill him, the fall would have. But his brother was very hesitant to shoot him, so it's very possible it wasn't a fatal wound. And Jun Ho never does cease to amaze us. If anyone could swim back ashore, we think it would be him. We're holding on to some hope on this one. While not likely, it is still possible. Jumping off of that theory, there's also a version that suggests Ali is alive. He's the other main character death that we don't get to see with our own two eyes, making this theory possible. Though we don't understand how or why this would be the case, but I'm sure many people are hoping that Ali made it out. Despite what we said about him in our Dumb to Brilliant video, he is still one of our favorite characters. The VIPs represent the viewers. We were a little offended by this one, and we won't blame you if you were too. The original version of the theory, posed by Redditor and Perry13, draws parallels between the VIPs and Netflix subscribers who were watching the show, betting and theorizing about the outcome of the characters. We've seen several other similar theories or versions of it floating around the internet as well, that focus less on the Netflix subscription and more just audiences of violent shows in general. It compares us to the VIPs of all things. If you've watched our Squid Game characters Good to Evil script, you know we're not huge fans of the VIPs. That being said, the theory does hold water. There have been other stories that have been told with similar jabs at the audience for watching the content. A great example of that would be The Cabin in the Woods, where the metaphor is much clearer. The ancient gods that want to see the same old horror movie tropes over and over are, well, the audience who also expect to see those same tropes over and over. What I think makes it less effective in Squid Game, if that is indeed the messaging they were going for, is that it clashes with the more optimistic theme that humanity is ultimately good. While yes, we all get sucked into Squid Game from the comfort of our own couches to spectate, the idea that the show is trying to call us out for it while also preaching to us that we're good is conflicting. Of course, that's just one opinion. And if you feel like you could be a VIP in the Squid Game Observatory, then who are we to argue? 
the stepfather runs the American games. This stacks on top of another theory that appears a little later on our list. We'll elaborate on our thoughts later, but for now, all you need to know is that some viewers believe there are games like this being played in countries other than Korea. This part of the theory is the least plausible, but the most fun. It suggests that Ga Young's stepfather is going to run the next set of games in America. Now, setting aside the evidence of there being other games for a moment, let's talk about the stepfather getting paid to run the American branch. We love the theory. While there isn't a ton of evidence here, it is a compelling concept, especially if you didn't like the stepfather much, and really, who did? It's well established in the show that the economy isn't great in South Korea. Even Sang Woo's cover story was him doing business in America. So it's not terribly surprising that someone who is well off and is trying to support a family may well be chosen for a relocation. Sure, it could be just a coincidence that Ji Hun learns his child will be moving out of the country right before getting an opportunity to play in the games. But it's also possible that a shadow corporation responsible for all these games knew that he might be more inclined to play under pressure and chose very carefully when to relocate the stepfather, especially since we don't believe in coincidences when it comes to this show. We don't know what business he's involved in, and there isn't much to disprove the theory either, so it could be possible. Now we get to our next category. These next conspiracies make a lot of sense. In fact, we think that they're more likely to be true than not. These theories are probable. You can tell Ilnam is behind the games, slash the games are rigged for Ilnam. Do you remember how shocked you were when you found out the lovable old man was in fact behind the entire thing? That was the wildest twist in the show, which we thought had set the bar plenty high at that point. Well, this theory suggests that we should all feel stupid for not seeing it sooner. Aside from the one very obvious but circumstantial clue that the man is having way too much fun in the games, this theory offers some other compelling evidence. The first piece is the most disputed as it suggests the robot from Red Light Green Light is programmed not to scan him. Where the controversy comes in is in people's perception of the scanner. In some shots, it definitely looks like the scanner is picking him up with a green outline because he is holding still. In other shots, his outline looks much weaker. And some fans have said that it's just reflecting back from the outlines around him. We're not too sure what to make of that part, but the rest of the theory has us sold. The one thing that the staff didn't have much control over was which players killed one another during the nightly riots, and whose impassioned speech finally puts a stop to the bloodshed. You guessed it, player one. This old man's plea for a stop to violence rings differently on the rewatch, we'll say that. And finally, when Jun Ho is rifling through the files on the players, the binder actually seems to start with player two. The audience is in a hurry because Jun Ho is in a hurry, but we're kind of kicking ourselves for not picking up on that one. There is some other circumstantial evidence to back this one up as well. There are no other players quite as old as Ilna, and none that are terminally ill. When you stop to think about it, it doesn't make a ton of sense why they would want to bring a terminally ill man worried about dementia into a game like this designed to give everybody a fair chance. As for rigging the games in his favor, a lot of the evidence is the same. Even setting aside the idea that the scanner wasn't picking him up, Red Light Green Light was a game that he was good at, had experience with, and was likely to win. The same can be said about marbles, honeycomb, and even tug of war. Though regarding tug of war, we've noticed a lot of comments suggesting that Ilnam was never in any danger, and we just don't think that's true. Even with a great strategy for tug of war, they almost lost and it wasn't Ilnam who saved them and there were a lot of things that could have gone wrong in other games as well, even if they were rigged to help him as much as possible. He could have absolutely died for this stunt. The question is whether or not he would have even cared. What we do know is that when it came down to the game of marbles he lost, that game was definitely rigged to bring him out of the arena, making this theory probable despite other shakier evidence. Symbolic numbers. Speaking of player one, there is another fascinating theory about his number and Ji Hun's number 456. You might remember that there are only 456 players in the game, meaning that, of course, their numbers are the first and the last. The first number goes to the man who is responsible for the games. Is it possible that the last number goes to a man who is now set on ending the games? That is what the theory states. 
Given the end of Season 1, it looks likely. Could it also be foreshadowing about Jihan's eventual success? The VIPs are past winners. We find this one to be very plausible, but we place it in this section with one caveat. We believe that some of the VIPs could be past winners. It sounds a little outlandish when you first hear it, but thematically, we feel that it's very appropriate for the show if it were the case. It's well established in the narrative of Squid Game that having too much money desensitizes you to everything. That's why the games are created after all. And what's the prize for winning the Squid Game? A whole lot of money. It would add an entirely new layer to the symbolism of the show if winning the final game lets you become a spectator in future years, essentially turning you into the monster you survived. We also can't think of a bleaker metaphor for capitalism which this show has set out to criticize. Even if this was not the intention in showing us the VIPs this season, we would not be all that surprised to find out this is a plot element in Season 2. Finally, we have reached the truth. Confirmed truth. People have blown the whistle on these theories with such compelling evidence that they must be true, or a creator confirmed it. These theories are the truth bombs. Squid Game is a working model of game theory. Okay, so whether this was the intention or not behind Squid Game, it's impossible to argue the fact that it is a hypothetical working model of game theory in practice. And what exactly is game theory, some of you may be asking? Investopedia offers this definition. Game theory is the process of modeling the strategic interaction between two or more players in a situation containing set rules and outcomes. To dumb it down just a little bit for any of us who are more like Ji Han rather than Sang Woo, it's interactive decision making. And if you still don't quite understand what we're talking about, well, you don't have to look any further than Squid Game to see the perfect example. There were literally two or more players, in this case there were 456. There were also set rules and outcomes, but an almost infinite number of paths to get to one of those outcomes. Each decision that each player made in the games impacted the outcome of the games, not just for themselves, but for each of the other 455 players. This means that even as an individual player, you had to consider the actions of your peers to accurately determine a strategy, therefore letting other people's decisions or potential decisions impact your own. Each choice made interacts with all the other choices, times six. It's a mind-boggling number of possibilities and variables, and the more you think about it, the more you're going to realize how unlikely the single outcome we saw was. After the math teacher saw red light, green light in action, we're surprised he came back with these sorts of mathematical implications. Foreshadowing. Now, this theory is all but entirely confirmed by the set design of the show. We know the creators took pride in their foreshadowing for the games. We can see the pictorial representations of all six of the games adorning the walls behind the bunk beds once they get moved. The one that stuck out the most, at least in our opinion, were the shapes from Honeycomb. This theory does push the foreshadowing a little further. It illustrates all the parallels between players in Episode 2 and their eventual deaths. Seng Wu tries to commit suicide initially after leaving the game. He attempts to poison himself while lying fully dressed in his bathtub. The wetsuit is very similar to the outfit he eventually dies in during the reign of the final game. Se Byok threatens to kill a man with a knife to the throat. This is how she ultimately dies. Dyuk Su jumps off a bridge to avoid dealing with an issue from his past, and he's ultimately pushed off the bridge in Game 5. Ali takes a stack of money from a man on his day out of the games, and ultimately it's the thieving of his 20 hard-earned marbles that gets him shot. While the parallels between player deaths haven't been confirmed, and are less obvious than the walls, we don't buy for a second that they're a coincidence. And we're just hitting the broad strokes of this theory because there are a lot of examples of this type of foreshadowing. One of the most concise yet thorough rundowns comes from at bang 10613 on Twitter, but their post also gives credit to a hero Fitzerbert. Still, it's hard to be online these days without seeing more contributions to this line of theorizing in particular. This brings us to our final theory and the biggest truth bomb. The games are international. We promised we'd cycle back around to it, and here we are. This theory suggests that other countries are hosting games all around the world. Honestly, we believed it so much that we didn't even think it was a theory at first. We thought that this was as good as confirmed. When the VIPs show up to watch round 5 after all, 
One of them praises the frontman by saying the Korean game has been the best this year. Right, the contest in Korea was the best. This implies that there are games other than the one being held in Korea, and that they're an annual affair worldwide. The annual part of this statement is confirmed in canon. There are records showing that the games go back a long time. Likewise, Ji Hun sees the salesman recruiting the next year's contestants in the station a year after he takes the victory. So why wouldn't we take the whole statement as true? We certainly did, and that's why it earns our top spot. An absolute truth bomb. And that's it. All the Squid Game theories we could find ranked from BS to truth bomb. Let us know down below what theory you think is the biggest truth bomb. And if you need more Squid Game in your life, make sure to check out our Squid Game Dumb to Brilliant and Squid Game Good to Evil videos. Make sure to hit that notification bell, and most importantly, stay wicked.